In June 2008, Sound on Sound magazine ran a competition at the London International Music Show to win a massive bundle of studio equipment worth £20,000. As part of the prize, the SOS team would install the winner's equipment for a Studio SOS feature, which would run in the October issue of Sound on Sound. The winner was Dean McCarthy, and this was his home studio before we arrived. But before the team could get the equipment hooked up, the first job was to sort out the flutter echo with some acoustic treatment. Paul and Hugh explain their plan of action. So um, we've got the ghost panels which will go on these walls, but because of this sloping stuff on the ceiling, I think we might have to put some Aurelix up there. Yeah, because that way yeah, it'll hold up with a bit of glue. These things are rather heavy to put on the ceiling. Yes, good job we brought some of this along then, really. Yeah. Uh, any other problem spot shooting soon? No, we need something on this back wall, I think, because it's, yeah. it's parallel with the front. I think maybe this large ghost panel would work well on there. Yeah. And we've got a couple of corner traps we can put in the front. It's going to be tricky because of the angles, but it should work out okay. Yeah. Um, Dean's got the room set up in the right way and that he's facing down the long axis, so that's Absolutely. not too much to, to move around. Yeah, and the rest of the ceiling I think is going to be all right. So it should make a big improvement. There's no treatment in here at all. No, it's pretty live, and the wooden floor as well, it's, it's very light. Hmm. Yeah, let's see what we can do. Okay, let's get to it. The corner traps were first to go up. To make them most effective, they were positioned at the same height as the monitors, so they catch any resonating bass as soon as possible. Being an older house, the corners were not perfect right angles, making mounting more difficult than usual. This is one of the ghost panels designed for corner use. It fits on a square bracket, or we say it's a square bracket, it's actually a fairly flexible bracket. So if your corner's out of true, there is a certain amount of wiggle room, and then the thing just drops in on some keyhole slots, so it's easy to remove and sometimes tricky to line up, but once it's on there, it's on there. The second corner trap went up next, at the same height and mounted using the same technique. OK, well Paul's put up the, uh, the two corner wedges, which was not easy, but he's finally done it. The walls here aren't exactly square, which makes it a bit fiddly. But we've got the two corner panels up, and the next thing is to put this large panel, it's a 4 by 2 panel, which we're going to put horizontally across the back wall behind the speakers, and then to kill some of the dead space above it, we're going to put a couple of uh, wedge-shaped panels, and then we have four more to go on the back wall to uh, kill the flutter reflections up and down the room. So that's the next thing, and we start with this panel in the middle of that wall. Like the corner traps, the rectangular panel went at head height, maximising the efficiency of the absorber. It's always useful to have two people to do this, as well as a spirit level. So, with the area behind the monitors treated, it was onto the side walls and the mirror points, as Paul explains. We're about halfway through putting up the ghost panels because on uneven walls they're a bit of a challenge, you've got to jiggle around with the fittings a bit. It's, it helps if you've got two people to help line them up. But they've gone on, as you can see, we've got another four to get up, and then we're going to put a little Relex foam in places where we think we need to kill some further reflections. The opposing pair that you can see here are at the so-called mirror points, which is to try and kill the early reflections that bounce from the monitors off the side walls back to the listening position. So uh, given the position of the window, that's probably as close as we can get to optimal. Any hard flat surfaces in a room will reflect high frequency sound. And if there are two parallel walls, flutter echo occurs, where sound waves bounce back and forth between the walls. To tame these echoes, panels of foam were glued to the wall behind and above the monitors, on the angled ceiling and on the back wall of the studio. The next job was to wire up Dean's room. The cables, supplied by Studio Spares, were spec so that all parts of the prize would connect neatly together. But with Dean's mixer thrown into the equation, we had a few cabling issues. Once we'd overcome these, all the standalone gear was set up on the desk to the right of the mixing console, leaving the Studio Master free of clutter for hardware mixing. It was a tight squeeze, but the team got it all in. So, after a hard day's work, lots of coffee and some chocolate hobnobs, we'd finished. We'd turned Dean's attic bedroom into a professional recording facility, with a little help from our friends, of course. Starting before the signal chain even begins, Rycote's InVision shock mounts will help to keep low frequency rumbles from finding their way onto Dean's recordings. It works by cutting out the vibration in the direction of the sound that hits the mic head on, which is where most of the rumble comes from. Various mics were included with the prize, Rhodes K2 valve mic here will add a little warmth to his signal chain, while the new SE4400 will be a useful all-purpose addition to his mic cabinet. 
Shaw kindly donated their KSM27 and SM57 microphones to the bundle, which are commonplace in most studios around the world. All in all, let's just say he'll have plenty of choice on his next project. Roland's Phantom G6 keyboard will act as Dean's master controller, and with top-notch synths, keyboards and combinations on board, he'll be able to add that professional sound to his tracks. Inspiration will never be far away. His new Genelec 8040s will give him a monitoring source he can trust, while the Prime Acoustic Recoil Stabilizers will decouple them from the surface to keep any nasty resonances to a minimum. Korg's MR1000 records at super high DSD quality and comes with software that lets you convert your DSD files into other formats, meaning you can keep high resolution masters for backup purposes. Fortunately for Dean's neighbours, the Emerson Williams Bluestone Pro will allow him to turn his guitar amp up to 11, but monitor at low levels or even on headphones. Dean's favourite part of the bundle, however, is the SSL Minx, complete with a G-Series bus compressor, which is the top choice for many professional producers. Monitor control will be handled by the PreSonus Monitor Station, giving Dean hands-on control of multiple sources and destinations so he can control what he listens to and on which monitors with the flick of a button. Ederol's R09 is a perfect point-and-shoot mobile recorder with which Dean can capture sounds in the field for future editing. It's even got a little speaker on the back so he can monitor what he's recorded straight away. Akai's MPD32 gives Dean MPC-style pads for entering MIDI data and triggering samples. It's also got a bunch of assignable MIDI controls, including eight faders and eight rotary encoders. The Euphonics MC Mix will give Dean hardware control over the parameters in Logic, as well as any other DAW software he chooses to use. As you can probably tell, Paul's a big fan. I tried one of these out, it's probably one of the most intuitive controls I've come across and it just feels gorgeously professional. Yeah. It's got faders that you like, you know, ones that are not too, not too, not too floppy. Yeah. Uh, you get a wonderfully clear display at the top which you can read without glasses or a magnifying glass, unlike some of this text which is quite small and it works brilliantly with Logic or with Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And the clever thing is that when you switch from Logic to Pro Tools, you don't have to find a different mode on here, it knows, and automatically adapts to whatever you're mm -hmm. working with. Beneath Dean's mixer, there's now an Apogee Ensemble audio interface, which should keep all inputs and outputs as pristine as possible. We hooked it up to his mixer, so we can use the preamps and EQ for a little coloration on the input, and sum the multiple outputs from the Ensemble in the analog domain rather than digitally. There's also one of TC Electronics' latest power cores, the X8, for plug-in processing. The machine at the heart of Dean's new rig is an 8-core Apple Mac Pro, with stacks of RAM, a fresh copy of Logic Studio and a 23-inch Apple Cinema display connected, It should keep him happy for years to come. Also included in the bundle was an SSL Duende PCIe card for further plug-in processing, a TL Audio A1 dual preamp and DI, M Audio's MIDI Sport 4x4 interface and Pulsar 2 microphones, the Yamaha Tenorion which was the first to be given away in a competition of this kind, and as Dean mentioned the Allen & Heath Z22FX which he'll be using in his facility in Oxford. But that's not all for Dean, we've booked him on a course at Alchemia so he can become a qualified Logic user. Great stuff. We'd just like to say a big thanks to all the prize donors who gave so generously to the prize bundle. Also, to Dean's mum for the teas and coffee, and hobnobs, and to all those who entered the limbs competition. We'll see you next year, where, who knows, it might be you that takes home a studio full of gear. Thanks for watching.